This is The Heart of the Southland, a podcast series by the American Heart Association, representing the communities of Los Angeles, Ventura, and Santa Barbara counties. We come to you with topics that matter to your heart and brain health and share stories of people who are in relentless pursuit of equitable health where we live. Hello, everyone. I am Mika Lea. And hello, I'm Nicola Ross. Thank you for tuning in to Heart of the Southland. And Mika, how are you doing? I'm good, Nicola. I have been enjoying my summer, trying to get out, get some fresh air. How have you been? The same. You know, um, it's refreshing to be able to be out a bit more. And I've even done a little bit of traveling safely, though, with masks and distancing. I love it. I'm so excited to hear that. It makes me happy. Well, I'm so excited about our guest today. Do you remember that commercial about the most interesting man in the world? I totally remember that one. I know, right? I I bring it up to say, I honestly think that our guest today could very well be the most interesting man in the world. I agree, Nicola. Not only is he a renowned cardiologist, he is also the author of numerous publications and books, two of which have been accepted into the Smithsonian's Institute National Museum of African American History and Culture. He is the founder of the Association of Black Cardiologists and the Minority Health Institute, organizations that are dedicated to promoting deeper understanding of the adverse impact of cardiovascular disease on African Americans, addressing healthcare disparities, and promoting diversity in the healthcare workforce. And his accolades don't stop there. He's also received the Scroll of Merit, which is the highest award given by the National Medical Association as well as the Lifetime Achievement Award from Harvard Medical School. And then most recently and close to our hearts, he's the recipient of the Heart of Los Angeles Award from the American Heart Association for his decades long work of advancing health justice and equity for all. Not only that, he's the first African-American student from Delaware to attend Harvard and the first black postgraduate fellow to train at Harvard Medical School. What a trailblazer and a torchbearer who has paved the way for generations of Black men and women in medicine. And then to top all of that off, he's also an accomplished jazz trumpeter. So I almost think that our first question for our guest today should be, where do you find the time to achieve all of these great things? But It's my pleasure now to welcome to the show, Dr. Richard Allen Williams, the Clinical Professor of Medicine at David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and a longtime volunteer and leader for the American Heart Association. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Williams. Well, thank you so much, Nicola. I'm so thrilled to be here. I just want to say that I sometimes reach out to poetry to express my feelings about what we're doing. So if you will tolerate this, I just want to give a little quote from Alice in Wonderland. We are gathered here to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax and cabbages and kings. So we'll be talking about all those and many more things. Well, Dr. Williams, we are honored to be speaking with you today and getting to know a little bit more about you and and having our listeners understand your background. I have a question for you to start, and that is, You were born in Delaware in the 30s. Could you tell us about your family and what it was like growing up as an African-American during that time? When I was growing up in Wilmington, Delaware, in the ghetto, I had uh, some hopes to try to become a doctor. My inspiration was a pediatrician, a Black pediatrician that I had to go to from the age of four, who became my role model. And uh, I wanted to be just like him, as I told my mom. And so the rest was a matter of how I was going to be able to do that. Although I can't give you all the details, let me simply say that my teachers, my family, everybody kind of joined in as a a village 
so to speak, behind me to make sure that I achieved my purpose. I had a lot of support. And that's something that I think is necessary today to make sure that we give support to individuals who aspire to have careers like the one that I was fortunate to have. I love how you talk about where you came from in this. I'd love to hear more about this Black pediatrician And at what point in that relationship that you had with him, what's the story behind that inspiration? Well, very simply, he looked at me, and I guess it was because of the fact that he was a pediatrician and and considered children as very serious people. He took time out to talk to me as a serious person. His name was Dr. Edward Banton. What a wonderful, warm person he was. And so... He was an ideal role model for me, not just as a person, but as a doctor. I wanted to be able to to bring the same kind of comfort and uh, expertise to the people that I would be treating later. As far as my family is concerned, they were entirely supportive. And even though they didn't have much money, they had all the ambition in the world from the standpoint of trying to make their ninth and final child successful in pursuing the career that I wanted to pursue. And all I had to do was to supply the wherewithal from the intellectual standpoint to be able to reach those heights. And with their help, I did that. And with the help of the people at my high school. I just want to mention that at that time, things were very segregated in Wilmington, Delaware, as they were in many parts of the uh, southern part of the United States. I went to uh, Black schools, all Black schools from K through 12. Uh, The first time that I had any experience directly with anyone white was when I went to Harvard and had two white roommates to live with. And that was their first experience too with anyone Black. So it was an interesting situation. But I had a lot of help from my teachers who spent nights and weekends giving me extra instruction that they thought that I would need to do well on the college boards and so forth. And they, they were successful in inspiring me to do that because I scored almost perfect scores on the college boards and received a full ride, as they say, to Harvard University, which had never been done before for a Black person. Well, I understand also what had never been done was that you were actually the first African-American from Delaware to attend Harvard. So with all of that support and all of that ambition, you took that and, and pushed yourself forward. And I think we talked a little bit about the days, you know, the early days during that racial segregation, but that you started off, right, K through 12 was at Black schools. So How is that so dramatically different when you arrived at at Harvard and what was your experience there? I'd love to hear about that. Well, you've heard the term culture shock. It indeed was culture shock, not just for me, but for other people around me, most of whom were white. We only had, uh, let's see, I think it was six blacks in uh, my Harvard class out of um, uh, 10,000 students at Harvard at that time. There were only about 12 or 15 Black students in the entire university. So we were a rarity, uh, African Americans on campus or Negroes, as we were called at that time. And this was to remind you back in 1953 when I attended Harvard. So it was it was definitely culture shock for everybody all the way around. I was not at all used to dealing in that uh, milieu, and uh, neither were they. We learned from each other. I want to kind of also touch on, you talked about, you know, you were at Harvard in 1953, so a real pivotal time in U.S. history. So what impact did the civil rights movement have on you and your career? Huge impact. 1953 was the year before Brown versus Board of Education, the huge blockbuster decision from the U.S. Supreme Court came down, which changed the paradigm completely in regards to education and other things, civil rights-wise in the United States. And so I was right in the middle of all of that. And mind you, this was before affirmative action came into being. What we did as African-Americans or Blacks or Negroes at that time was really based entirely on our own efforts. 
We didn't get any leg up at all. We had to achieve on our own. And uh, I think that made things a lot more significant. Not that affirmative action wasn't important as it came down later, it was extremely important. But uh, this was individual effort on the part of those of us who went through things at that time. I just wanna um, start by saying how captivating it really was to hear you talk about your beginnings. And it made me reflect on how you had humble beginnings with high hopes. And those high hopes were met with support. And that was foundational to you being able to move forward successfully. In reflecting on that, I also considered how you chose to pay it forward in your life by addressing other needs and helping others have opportunities that were similar to yours. And one of the ways that you uh, did that resulted in some pivotal increases in the number of Black medical students and residents at Harvard. Can you talk about how you undertook that effort? That was uh, indeed a, a pivotal effort which occurred actually many years after I attended undergraduate school at Harvard. My undergraduate career was from 1953 through 1957. My uh, postgraduate career began in 1968 when I was accepted into the cardiology program at Harvard Medical School and Brig Brigham and Women's Hospital for my cardiology training. And at that time, I discovered to my astonishment, that I was the first individual ever to be accepted into a postgraduate program at Harvard, and indeed at any of the Boston hospitals, which are very, very prestigious. Rather than sitting down and saying, gee, I'm so lucky to get in and uh, I'll just go ahead and do the best that I can do. It was my incentive and my intention to try to see not only why that was the case, that no Blacks had ever been admitted before, but also to find out what could be done to increase and improve Black acceptance. So to make a long story short, I started a program which resulted in the establishment of what we called the Central Recruitment Council at Harvard University, which was instrumental in recruiting Black and other minority students into Harvard Medical School for the first time in its history. I'm very proud of that. I received in 2004, a Lifetime Achievement Award from Harvard for my efforts in that regard. And it's, that was one of the proudest moments of my life. That is quite an honor and wonderful and much needed work. Can you give us an idea of what the numbers of Black student representation was around the time that you started, and then now? Has enough progress been made, would you say, towards representation of Blacks in medicine today? If you're talking about Harvard in particular, yes, there has been a great deal of progress made on a number of fronts in regards to the involvement and acceptance of Blacks into medicine. And in particular, Harvard now has a dean, they established a department and a deanship for diversity, inclusion, and equity. That was established particularly because of the efforts that we made to try to bring attention to this problem of inclusion and, and equity. That has resounded and resonated around the country because almost every, every medical school in the country now has such a department. So that's a huge increase in amount of progress, not only at Harvard, but, but throughout the nation. I might add that the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, which is now headed by Dr. David Scorton, has taken up the beat, so to speak, after initially being non-involved and really, in a sense, opposed to that type of movement in the, the past. And remind you, this is an organization that's over 100 years old and has oversight over medical schools in the United States. They have moved ahead and have been become proactive in regards to establishing programs of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and uh, pushing for that throughout the medical education in the United States. So those, those are huge areas of progress. 
And I just feel so fortunate in being involved uh, uh, at the ground level in the development of all of that. Certainly great examples of your ability to trailblaze and to establish a program that's been modeled by other institutions to really address health equity and the needs for representation. So thank you for your work there. Let me break in for a moment, Nicola, before you move on to the next point. You use the term trailblazer, and I love that term, but I kind of changed that to something else that's, that I think is more significant from the standpoint of, of what I've done. The progress that I made and the impact that I made was not without riling a few people's feathers and kicking up some dust. And so I essentially call myself a hell raiser rather than just a trailblazer. And I think that raising a little hell got some results. Well, it stands to reason that taking a strong stance is often what is required to make change. Speaking of acting confidently, you are the author of numerous publications, several books to your credit, and one of them would be the textbook of Black-related diseases, which was published in 1975. It's regarded as a seminal work that brought attention to the need for a culturally competent approach to healthcare for African Americans and other people of color. Can you talk about why you wrote that book and its significance? Everything that I've done in my life and career has a connection back to the origins of my struggle to try to achieve some equity and justice and so forth. That book is certainly connected to my early efforts to try to achieve some equity and inclusion and diversity at Harvard. Because when I was in my training program in cardiology at Harvard Medical School, it came upon me that there was no repository of information on medical conditions of African Americans. And that's something that I was trying to get a better definition of. So after consulting with some of the people that I knew and respected in medicine, I decided to write a pamphlet addressing this. And my boss at, at the Brigham said, well, why don't you go beyond uh, doing a pamphlet and try to turn this into a book, which I did. So my dream went from a 35 page pamphlet to an 800 page book, which took me five years to produce. It's called the textbook of black related diseases because of the fact that the term which I invented was to describe the fact that there are diseases and illness connected to the condition of blackness or ethnicity, you might say, race, which are important to observe. Bear in mind that there's a big controversy as to whether or not the term race should either even be used. I agree that it is not a biological construct, but it is a social construct. Nevertheless, it does exist. It, there are different races. I mean, that's an obvious thing. Can't deny that. And so it's important to look at what is obviously important from a medical standpoint as to what impact race or ethnicity may have on one's medical condition. And that's what that book did. It called attention to the fact that the first thing that any doctor needs to do in addressing medical issues with a patient is to look at, at that person's race or, race or ethnicity, as well as gender and other characteristics, and to personalize one's approach to the patient. This is something that has come into more recent vogue now, personalization of medical attention. But I was fortunate to uh, kind of pioneer outlook on that, as well as cultural competency which has become something that is very important to recognize as well. That is the importance of having the doctor have some competency in regards to how he or she looks at the patient. That's again, another personalized type of characteristic that needs to be recognized and explored. Can you give us an example of a black related disease where that cultural competence you're speaking of becomes very important in diagnosis and treatment? What I call the poster child of all black related diseases is sickle cell anemia. That's the first one that I dealt with back in 1975 and before that in looking at these diseases that are related to one's ethnicity. I don't have to tell anybody how important that is because 
when a baby is born, he or she needs to be tested to see whether or not there are characteristics of sickle cell anemia or sickle cell trait. And even before birth, the parents need to be accessed in regards to whether they are carriers or have the disease itself. And uh, without doing that, one is going to be side blinded uh, by a situation in which uh, children are born with a disease that can cause death at an early age. Just to give a quick example of how important that is, one of my colleagues, Dr. Marilyn Gaston, who was an assistant surgeon general of the United States many years ago, she observed that many children who were born with sickle cell anemia within just a few months would develop pneumonia and would die from the pneumonia. And so she recommended that all children with sickle cell, who are born with sickle cell anemia, be treated with antibiotics at an early age. And that resulted in the saving of innumerable black lives, just based on the observations that she made about the characteristics of this disease and the ravages. So I think that gives a perfect example of how important it is to look at the disease profile that patients have and to individualize and personalize one's, the doctor's approach to patients, not only black patients, but to all patients. Great example. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, we've been talking about the foundational medical information from your book, the textbook of black related diseases. And Mika mentioned earlier that that book was accepted into the Smithsonian, but you have a current book that was also accepted into the Smithsonian, and that is Blacks in Medicine. Would love to talk to you now about Blacks in Medicine and why you feel it was important to document the issues that are uh, affecting Black health and medicine in that book. Well, first of all, I just want to show you that book, and here it is. I'm not trying to commercialize things, but I think that people need to know that there is an actual book that has been produced about the Black experience in medicine, and this goes back 5,000 years. I would certainly recommend this book to anyone interested in treating medical conditions in African Americans because it contains a compendium of information about various peculiar and special aspects of the disease process in African Americans and also issues deals with issues of social justice and even deals with issues such as the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color. So it is in the moment, and it is something that I hope that people will look at as being a good resource to accompany their interest in pursuing resolution to the problems that we face now regarding social justice in medicine and also diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. On that note, Dr. Williams, of social justice and equity and inclusion, it was in the mid-70s that you founded the Association of Black Cardiologists, and then about 10 years later, the Minority Health Institute. I'd love to hear about what gaps and issues that you saw out there that motivated you to establish these organizations. Well, I want to repeat the fact that I've always been, you say a trailblazer, but I say a hell raiser. And anytime I've seen an issue that needed to be addressed, especially if it had racial or ethnic aspects to it, I've tried to address it in medicine. That was the situation with my establishment or founding of the Association of Black Cardiologists, or ABC, which I founded in 1974. And that situation arose because of the fact that despite the efforts that were being made by a number of individuals and organizations throughout the country to try to address the plethora of problems in cardiovascular disease, there was not really uh, enough effort being made to address that problem, those problems as they pertain to people of color and particularly to Blacks. And in fact, the information that was needed to make any assessment was not available. So in looking at that through the lens that I created uh, with the textbook of Black-related diseases, 
I decided that there needed to be a special but connected effort made by people who were interested in cardiovascular disease in Blacks. And uh, I pulled together some of my Black colleagues at a meeting of the a convention of the American Heart Association in uh, 1974 in Dallas, Texas. And we founded the Association of Black Cardiologists, the ABC. The rest is history, as they say. That was 46 years ago. I might mention that we have worked very closely with the AHA over the years and have gotten tremendous help from the AHA and the efforts that we've made in trying to bring attention to these problems. And we're coming full circle now because, as you know, we have a 100th anniversary of the American Heart Association coming up in 2004, 2024, sorry. And uh, uh, as such, we uh, have to be interested in making certain that the full history of the AHA is known and also the fact that we have come full circle from the time when there wasn't so much knowledge or interest even in cardiovascular problems in African Americans to the point now where there is tremendous interest and uh, action being taken. And we are moving ahead together to effect some changes that need to be made. So what I'm hearing is we have made progress, which is good. <laughs> yeah, that's to put it succinctly, absolutely. Right? What other changes, because you've come so far, being the Hellraiser that you are, <laughs> what changes would you like to see in the next 10 years? I've reached a point in my career where I can, uh, I guess you might say, ascend to the mountaintop and look over and see what might not only be needed, but might lie ahead. And what I see lying ahead is a tremendous amount of interest on the part of younger individuals, people who are able to pick up the, the stick and pass it on, continue the relay race that we're in to try to achieve not only equity in healthcare delivery, but social justice in regards to these issues that we are facing now. So to answer your question more specifically and succinctly, what I look for in the next 10 years is an increase in those efforts being made and those efforts being advocated for by organizations like the American Heart Association. The AHA is leading the way in regards to all of that. Dr. Williams, we would be remiss if we did not talk about the long history of mistrust among Black people toward medical doctors and medical institutions. Would you please talk to us about some of the reasons behind that? And what do you think it takes to create change? Well, first of all, I think we need to define what the problem is. The uh, issue of trust, which is something that I've written about in Blacks in Medicine, is something that has not been thoroughly explored, especially from a racial or ethnic standpoint, and it needs that kind of exploration. Certainly there's been a great deal of concern since the Tuskegee study, which originated in 1942 here in the United States in the South, in Alabama. It involved experiments which were done involving 400 or so black men who were sharecroppers in Alabama who had syphilis. And the purpose was to follow them to their death and through autopsy to determine the natural history and the changes that would occur on the body from that, the ravages of that disease. And it was one of the worst incidents and probably the worst incident of medical experimentation in our history. With that as a backdrop, the fact that people were not fully informed about what they were being involved in and the fact that they were being used for experimental purposes for other people's advantage is something that is sobering regarding what we're looking at now about people, for instance, being trusting about uh, accepting vaccines against COVID-19 virus. So that is something that is opened back up with the COVID-19 pandemic. The issue of trust is coming back into view and uh, the question is whether people can trust 
their the medical advice that they receive are they in danger of being experimented upon again or exploited or whatever so we need to have more dialogue about that there is not enough dialogue we need to have more inclusive dialogue that is including many of the people who are at risk from this trust issue rather than having a number of talking heads at the government level etc or organizational level and so what i advocate is having more for instance town halls throughout the country on issues of trust connecting for instance issues of heart disease treatment across cultural uh, bounds as well as other conditions that we need to look at such as covid-19 and the disproportionate impact that it makes on communities of color so it's a, a full blown situation which touches on every aspect of our lives particularly uh, something that we need to get on top of if we hope to defeat things like the covid pandemic we have to have a higher level of trust instilled in the people who are of victims of these this disease particularly those who are much more vulnerable you know dr williams thank you for talking about the history which has been fraught with lack of information and lack of consent and then reflecting on a very concrete forward looking solution in the example that you gave about town halls because that's an opportunity to foster dialogue information ask questions and have your questions answered and i think that could certainly go a long way toward people feeling more informed more included and more a part of the process in terms of making their medical decisions that was a a big topic and i want to give mika a chance to share a few more questions that she may have as well Thanks, Nicola. I I love the idea of the town halls and to start those dialogues. And, you know, obviously recent news shows that the rates of the coronavirus cases and hospitalizations are worsening for Black residents in Los Angeles County and Black communities have the lowest vaccination rates. You know, the same is true for many other cities around the country. We talked a little bit, you talked about the mistrust and where it comes from and, and the history behind that how how do we change that narrative outside of the town halls and i'm just i would love for you to give a message to all of those people listening what would your message be to help instill that trust and to help encourage people to get vaccinated i think that you have to go to the people whom you hope to develop trust in and ask them what they need to uh, be uh, trusting of organizations institutions advice etc i don't think enough of that has been done and the other thing is that it's important to try to recruit and incorporate the faith community into all of this churches have a tremendous impact on black life i don't think that there's been enough dialogue between uh, churches and organizations for instance such as the american heart association or the association of black cardiologists in regards to issues such as trust that can go a long way towards bringing about greater trust because believe me the people are going to listen to their ministers before they listen to their doctors about issues of health if the doc if the ministers say yeah we think it's a great great idea for you to get vaccinated a lot of people will get vaccinated who may not have listened to their healthcare providers. Dr. Williams, you make a great point about partnering with organizations in the community where we can reach people and just wanted to share that the Heart Association where actually we see faith-based organizations as key important community partners and we're doing a lot of work with them around chronic conditions but your point is well made that the information sharing and the uh, fostering of trust is an opportunity that aligns perfectly with the work that we do with faith-based organizations and i i want to make a further point about that too it's important for organizations such as the american heart association to uh, make sure that it has individuals who can go to the faith-based organizations and talk to them they want to hear from people who look like them i think that we as the heart association have a job ahead of us to make sure that we recruit more people 
who are able to operate within that area. We need to take a closer look at ourselves and uh, see what we need to do to change that paradigm. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And your point is well received. It's actually a part of our national CEO, Nancy Brown's uh, 2024 impact goal and 10 commitments to look at uh, representation within the organization, as well as opportunities for growth and, and promotion. I know Nancy very well, and uh, I know that she's serious about bringing it into reality, and that's gonna get done. I have all the faith and confidence in the world, in her and in this organization to bring that about. I, I wanna mention at this point that, as many of you know, the new president-elect of the American Heart Association is a black, cardiologist, Dr. Michelle Albert, and I think that she's going to be very pivotal from the standpoint of some of the internal changes that are perhaps going to be made within the organization. We really are proud to have her leadership. And to your point, it takes working together. It takes advocates like you and Dr. Albert, along with the American Heart Association, to really achieve the change that we're striving toward. To that point, I, I have another question for you. This is a question on your championing of the concept of humane medicine. Can you talk about what humane medicine is and how it's applied to the teaching and practice of medicine in this country? Well, humane medicine is my concept that I invented to try to cover several things that don't seem to be inclusive or included in the general aspect of medical treatment or uh, medical concerns. It has to do with trying to be more inclusive in putting things such as consideration of gender-specific aspects of geriatric considerations, certainly of racial and ethnic considerations, into the mix when we talk about not only heart disease, but illness and disease in general. So it's a more humanistic and more comprehensive approach to medicine. It is also much more personalized. It's a matter of, as I mentioned, realizing that one size does not fit all and that we have to have more personalization of our approach to the patient. And it is also very, very importantly, patient-centered. It's a matter of making sure that our approach to treating people focuses more on the patient or things from the patient's standpoint, not from the standpoint of the doctor as has been the tradition in the past. And so that's basically what humane medicine is. It's something that doesn't really exist as a, an entity. It's an idea that came from my head to try to pull together all of the things that I think need to be in our approach to medicine at the present time. And slowly we're picking up these pieces and putting them together. And uh, even though we may not use the term humane medicine for it, Eventually, we're going to get to the point where all of the precepts that I've laid out are accomplished. Well, in light of this humane medicine concept that you've conceived, when it comes to eliminating disparities and improving health care for Black communities, what's your vision for the future? Uh, my vision for the future in regards to how we approach uh, Black communities is that uh, hopefully we will no longer have to isolate our concerns for Black community or any other communities and separate them out from the general, our general concern, that we will indeed be able to say, yeah, we can approach all of these problems uh, as one and not have to look at from a a separate standpoint. I don't know how long that's going to take. It may not ever happen, but I think that that ought to be in the mix from the standpoint of the way that we are approaching things. We want to have some, I guess you might say, homogeneity in regards to uh, how we'll be able to approach medical solutions in the future. And only way we can do that is by trying to achieve equity in regards to healthcare delivery, not necessarily equality, but equity, which are two different things. I think with efforts such as what is being made by the AHA and by the ABC and so many of the wonderful organizations and the people like you who volunteer your tremendous efforts will get there. 
Dr. Williams, we are coming to the end here, but I have a few more questions that I think would just be fun and lighthearted and our, our listeners are going to appreciate. So the first of which is, I know on top of all your amazing achievements, Nicola mentioned in the beginning that you play jazz trumpet in a quintet. So I would love for you to talk a little bit about how that role of music has played itself out in your life. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because it's something that's very close to use an expression to my heart. My musical in uh, interest started around the same time that my medical interest did. I started playing the trumpet at around the age of six or seven. Eventually became, I guess you might say, proficient enough to perform in uh, my high school band. That was a very, very pivotal point in my life because first of all, the band leader, Dr. Harry Andrews was a very, very strong black man and became one of my image makers and people who, whom I admired so much. He was the one who convinced me that I had to become a, a very forceful type of person in trying to achieve the things that I wanted to achieve and gave me a great deal of incentive along with teaching me a great deal about music. So I got more than just a musical education from him. The other thing is that I uh, had as one of my contemporaries, a gentleman named Clifford Brown. Many of you may not recognize his name, but he happened to have been a fantastic jazz trumpeter and the person that I recognize as the best jazz trumpeter of all time. He was three years ahead of me in high school, and he taught me a great deal about jazz and other types of trumpet playing. So I got a lot out of that association. When I got to Harvard, I had been admitted as a 16-year-old, and I really didn't have very much knowledge about much of anything except maybe a, a bit of academic stuff, and uh, I was pretty much of a nerd there. And I was appointed by this group, that jazz group that I joined at Harvard to uh, go and interview Miles Davis, who's a famous jazz musician appearing in Boston. So reluctantly, I went and did that. And that really changed my life quite a bit because Miles, in his typical fashion, gave me a lot of uh, instruction on various things in life. And... Uh, became a lifelong friend and eventually one of my patients. It, needless to say, embellished my musical enjoyment. And over the years, I've had a number of very satisfying experiences in music and have joined my interest in music with my interest in medicine. Most recently, I've had my jazz band as the Raw Sugar Jazz Quintet to uh, give a number of concerts at the Kedron Vaccine Center in South LA with the purpose of trying to attract people to come and get vaccinated while they listen to some cool jazz. I want to mention something that is very close and personal to me, and that is that a number of people have recognized my deep interest in music and have become sort of fans, which is very flattering to me. I have here a book of poems that was written by a doctor, a Dr. Gregory Douglas. It's called Circular Breathing and it has on its cover one of my mentors, Miles Davis. And he wrote a poem in here, which was dedicated to me. And it was called Wearing Hot Lips, R-A-W. He mentioned, I'll just quote a couple of things. Man, that cat is so cool. shooby doo shooby doo wop sitting there pressed to the bone, ice water in his veins, fire in his horn, and out of his throat comes these notes. And he goes down as he floors us with his sounds while simultaneously blowing us all away. Somebody turn that air conditioner on. So that's something that was very, very flattering to me to have somebody actually write a poem about me and my music. I've had a lot of wonderful experiences in music as I have in medicine. And I, I'm trying to join them together 
and make people understand that indeed music is the best medicine and that they can uh, get a great deal of cardiovascular and other comfort by turning to music. I love that so much. And I had all these other questions, but I don't want to ruin the vibe that is going on right now. So we do this fun thing at the end of every show and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you and I, I cannot wait for your answer, which Dr. Williams, the question is what makes your heart happy? My goodness, things that make my heart happy are things that uh, I see are making other people happy that I'm able to participate in. That's been my whole life, trying to bring happiness and joy to other people through the things that I've done. And I think that I've been reasonably successful in, in bringing that about. I would like to point particularly to my children, whom I think I have made extremely happy in regards to uh, the things that I've tried to inspire them to do, as well as many of my other relatives. My whole thing is to try to bring happiness and joy and delight to as many people as I possibly can. And that's really what I consider my overwhelming mission, an overarching mission in life. So to the extent that I can be successful in doing that, I'm going to consider myself as a success in life, much more than anything that I've done from a clinical standpoint in cardiology and medicine in general. Dr. Williams, um, what a poignant note for us to wrap up on. And it's always great when we can uh, end our show on a fun note. So thank you for indulging our uh, what makes your heart happy question. Thank you so much for taking time to talk to us uh, and be so generous in sharing about your life and your experiences and sharing your wisdom with our listeners. And then most of all, we want to thank you for your leadership and for your unwavering commitment to health equity. Thank you. And before I uh, buzz off, I, I just want to throw things right back at you because I couldn't be more impressed with all of the wonderful efforts that are being made by all of you at AHA. I want you to know that I will continue to be in support of you, even though we still have a ways to go to achieve that equity goal. We will get there and we'll get there because we are doing things together. You're absolutely right, Dr. Williams. And so everyone, this is part of the Southland. Until next time. The Heart of the Southland is a production of the American Heart Association. Our music, Listen to Your Heart, featuring Abby London, is written by David Nero. You can find us at heart.org slash Los Angeles. For daily inspiration, heart and stroke news, healthy living tips, and more, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at AHA Southern CA and on Twitter at AHA California.